You hear me okay? Yeah? Yeah, okay, good. Well, I had an unusual experience just now. I sat in the front row, which I normally don't do because I come with my whole family and I don't want to be embarrassed in front of you all as my two little guys are poking each other throughout Ken's sermon. Today I came by myself. I left the fun part of the family at home. I sat in the front row and it's a privilege and I'll tell you why. When you sit in the front row, you can hear everybody singing. Yep, okay, so, uh, now I gotta gather myself and preach a sermon. All right, um, <clears throat> isn't this a nice water bottle? I'll tell you, there's some churches that know how to give good gifts to their people. This is from the men's conference. So I, I wanted to show you the water bottle just to prove that I actually was at the men's conference. I was there for about an hour. I was probably the person that spent the least amount of time at the conference. So I missed Friday, sorry. Came in on Saturday in time to have a breakfast burrito, get the gift bag, (laughs) and then get a phone call with a family emergency, and I had to leave. But I've been using this all week, so even though I didn't really get to fellowship and hear all the messages and stuff, I've been blessed. Good water bottle. (laughs) All right. You know, uh, a sermon on a Sunday morning ought to be an opportunity for us to hit the reset button. So we all have our devices, and we know that when our devices start to act up, one of the ways to try to fix them is to hit the reset button. A sermon on a Sunday morning is a chance to readjust the way that we think about God, the way that we understand our relationship to Him. And this morning, I'd like to help all of us hit the reset button, and I'm going to talk to you about a particular doctrine that comes out of the scriptures. So as, as an introduction, I, I just I want to talk about repentance just for a second. That's not going to be the, the main point of the sermon, but I think all of you know, if you've walked with the Lord for a while, that you, you've had that feeling of you sin and you know you need to repent, you know you need to turn back to God, but it's hard. Why is repentance hard? Why do we find it hard to turn back to God after we've sinned against Him? Well, sometimes it's because we're ashamed of what we've done. Other times it's because we know that if we're really going to repent, we probably are going to have to make some restitution. So it's like if you lie to somebody, if you're really going to repent, you need to go back and tell that person the truth. We need to bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and that's hard. But there's another reason why I think sometimes it's hard for us to turn back to God in repentance, and this has a solution. That reason that I'm thinking of is this. Too often, when we're going to turn back to God in repentance, we imagine that He's up in heaven with His arms crossed, scowling at us. We think that if we turn back to him, he'll forgive us, but he's probably going to growl at us a little bit first. Or maybe he's going to lean on us and lecture us a little bit so that we feel bad and we don't fall into that sin again. We know that he'll restore us, but sometimes we think that he does so grudgingly. And I want to suggest to you this morning that that is not the image that God wants us to have in our heads concerning Him. That's not how He wants us to understand our relationship to Him. So to hit that reset button and to reprogram a little bit our thinking about God this morning, I want to talk to you about the biblical doctrine of adoption. I'm going to talk about adoption. So let's start with the basics. I think we probably all know what adoption is in general. Adoption is about being included in a family that you previously were not a part of. And the Bible says that God adopts into His family everybody who believes in His Son, Jesus Christ. But maybe what I just said sounds a little strange to you because God created all people, right? So if God created us, aren't we sort of automatically His children? just by virtue of being born into this world? Isn't everybody a child of God? 
That's a, actually a really common thought these days. If you stop people on the street and you ask them, a lot of people would probably tell you, yeah, sure, everybody is a child of God. It's a common idea, but it's wrong. The Bible teaches us something different. Now, the Apostle Paul does affirm that we're all God's offspring. That's, that's the language that he uses. So if you go to Acts chapter 18, you don't have to turn there now, but he's, he's preaching in Athens, he's speaking to a bunch of pagans, and he says, yeah, we're all God's offspring, but what does he mean by that? That doesn't mean that automatically we form part of his family just by virtue of being born. What it means is that we're all creatures. We've all been created by God. That same Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 that before somebody believes in Jesus Christ, he or she is not a child of God, but a child of wrath. Isn't that strong language? But it gets even stronger. (laughs) If you turn back a few pages to the Gospel of John, John chapter 8, what does Jesus say? He's talking to some Jews who didn't believe in him, and he says, you don't have God as your father. Your father is the devil. So you see, adoption isn't a physical blessing. It's not something that you receive automatically by being born into the world. Adoption is a spiritual blessing, and it only comes by new birth. Jesus says at the beginning, well, it's not Jesus, it's John writing in the beginning of his gospel, that those who are born of God, those who receive Jesus Christ, those who believe in his name, only those people have the right to be called children of God. To be a child of God, to be a part of his family, is a blessing that's only found in Jesus Christ by faith. Without Jesus, it would be impossible for any of us to be called God's children. We don't deserve to be adopted. We don't deserve to be a part of God's family. We have to be brought in from the outside. We start on the outside and we're brought in as we trust in Jesus Christ. But that raises another question. So if I'm a sinner and I'm prone to turn my back to God, why in the world would he want me to be a part of his family? Or we could ask the question a little bit differently. Like, how how do I get into God's family? If I start on the outside being sinful, being rebellious, how do I get in? Maybe God's waiting for me to get my act together. Maybe if I could just be more virtuous, if I could grow in holiness and be the kind of person that could contribute to his family, maybe then he'd let me in. Is that how it works? Well, we could think that maybe that's how it would work. And actually, I think that in the first century, people who are reading the New Testament might have been even more likely to think that way because adoption worked differently in the ancient world than it does today. We think about adoption just on a human level generally. Families that adopt typically adopt very small children, sometimes even babies, and it's just an act of mercy. It's an act of kindness, adopting a child without having any idea how they're going to turn out when they grow up. That's not how adoption worked in the ancient world. In the ancient world, people adopted children who were much older. So imagine a couple in the first century that's wealthy, they have an estate, and they don't have children. Well, they want somebody to carry on the family line, and they want an heir. They don't adopt a baby. They adopt a teenager. They adopt maybe even a young adult. After screening the person and making sure that they're of good character and they're going to represent the family well, that's not how adoption works for the Christian. We'd have to wait for a really long time to be adopted if God were going to adopt us on the basis of our own character. He doesn't adopt us because of who we are. He adopts us in spite of who we are. God doesn't adopt good and powerful people. He adopts rebels, and he adopts the weak to form a part of his family. We are included in the family, and we participate in the family inheritance, not because we deserve it. It's because of something that Jesus did for us. So that takes us to the next point. I'm going to say something here that's going to be provocative. And I was told that this could perhaps electrocute me. 
So the guys back there at the sound table, <clears throat> if I say something really weird, they're going to shock me. If I start shaking, convulsing, and smoking. But give me a minute, I'll explain it. Don't shock me just yet. Adoption is connected to another really important doctrine that comes out of the Bible. It's the doctrine of justification. Justification and adoption go hand in hand. There's this massive barrier that's between me and being a part of God's family if I'm left to myself, and that barrier is my sin. In justification, my sin is removed and the path is open for me to be a part of God's family. So imagine this. Imagine that salvation is like a big closet. You don't have to raise your hands, but how many of you in here have closets that are so full that you're afraid to open them because things will fall out on you? Right? I mean, a lot of us have closets like that in our household. So I want you to have that idea. Salvation is like a closet, and it is so full that if you can get that door open, all the blessings that Jesus earned for us in his life and his death are going to fall out on you like a flood. It's going to be amazing. So you go up to that closet, and you want to open the door, and you grab the handle, and you can't, you can't open it. And, and you put your foot up on the door jam, right? I mean, you get the idea. I can't lift my leg up any higher than that. But, and you're pulling, and you can't get the door open. You can't open that door because you're not worthy. In and of yourself, you don't deserve to be able to open that door. And so God has to do something. God shows up with a key, and that key is justification. Justification. That's when God forgives us of all our sins, and he counts, or he reckons, or he attributes Jesus' perfect life of obedience to us. It's as if he gives all that Jesus deserves, he puts that in your account. And so you are, by faith, just as worthy as Jesus Christ to be in heaven. And God declares you righteous. And he comes with that key, and that righteousness opens the door. And that door opens, and all those blessings fall out on top of you. And one of the first ones to fall out is adoption. That's how justification and adoption fit together. I need to be forgiven. I need to be given Jesus' righteousness, and now I can form part of the family with my older brother, Jesus Christ. Now, here's where I'm going to be provocative. Justification is fundamental, isn't it? And a lot of people in church history have said that justification is the doctrine on which the church stands or falls, and that is well said. We need justification. It's the key that opens the door to the salvation closet so that we can enjoy all the rest of the blessings that are in Jesus. But the crowning blessing of the Christian faith is not justification, it's adoption. I'm still standing here. I haven't been electrocuted. Because you're going to give me a minute, right? I didn't come up with that by myself, by the way. I saw that in J.I. Packer's Knowing God. How many of you have read that book? It sold millions of copies. He's got a chapter on adoption, which is absolutely amazing. And Packer, he's not the first one who said it. There's others, like John Owen, for example, in church history, who have said adoption is the crowning blessing of the Christian life. In a sense, it's greater than justification. And Packer explains it like this. In justification, I know God as a judge. And I respect the judge. And I'm grateful for the judge because he forgives my, sin, my sins and he declares me righteous. But after that, I don't have sweet, tender, intimate communion with the judge. The judge doesn't care for me, providing for my daily needs, guiding me in my life. The judge doesn't do that. Who does that? The father. I know the judge in the divine courtroom, and I'm eternally grateful for what he does for me there. But I know the father in the family room. Now, I'm not talking about separate gods, obviously. We have a multifaceted relationship with God. That was a big word, wasn't it? Multifaceted. Our relationship with God has lots of different aspects to it. But what I want to say this morning is that if we stop short with justification and we don't go on to adoption, there's so much that we miss in terms of rich, sweet, tender communion with our God. 
So what, what is so great about adoption? And why would J.I. Packer and others say that it's the highest privilege of every believer? Well, I've got a list of four or five things here that are benefits that come from our adoption into God's family. In the first place, because we're adopted, we have communion with our heavenly father. So as an adopted son, I rejoice in friendship with God. And I enjoy a relationship with him that's not unlike a relationship that I could enjoy with a human being. We talk. I can talk to God in prayer. He responds back to me through his word. But my relationship with God is even richer and more tender than mere friendship. Because when I pray, I pray to my perfect heavenly father. Think about that for a minute. I'm praying to my perfect heavenly father, which gives me great confidence as I draw near. Because as a perfect father, he never ignores me. He's always interested in listening to what I have to say. He's always available. He's always happy to see me. Does that surprise you a little bit? He always helps. And I draw near to God as a child to his loving father. I ask you this morning, do you think about God like that? The reason why I ask that question is because years ago I was teaching through, we were working through the Lord's Prayer, and how does Jesus teach his disciples to pray? Lord. I mean, well, yeah, Lord, sovereign, that's in other prayers, so I don't want to say, uh, Father is how he teaches them to pray. And I was teaching through this, and, and there was a lady in our congregation who said, you know, you need to be really careful when you tell people that they should imagine God as a father. And she said that because so many people have had dads who are real boneheads. And I don't remember how I responded to her. <laughs> but what I should have said was, it's not me who's saying that we need to call God our Father. It's Jesus Christ himself. Some of you still have your Bibles open to Matthew 6. Turn a page to Matthew 7. And we're going to read a really interesting passage. Matthew 7, verses 9 through 11. It is true that not everybody has had a great father. No earthly father is perfect. I know I'm not. So my, my youngest is, uh, he's got a lot of energy and he's always tugging on my shoulder. And sometimes he can't get my attention and he'll say, Papa, 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 Papa. And I'm between the fact that I'm busy and I'm getting older and I'm, I'm not, maybe even, I'm not trying to blow him off, but he can't get my attention. Papa, Papa, Papa. Then he says, Matthew. And that works every time. <laughs> There's two people in the world who call me Matthew, my mom and my youngest son. <laughs> No earthly father is perfect. Some are flat out rotten. And we could think, wow, Jesus, that's dangerous to invite people to think about God like a father. What if they had a rotten father? Are they going to project that on God? Listen to what Jesus says. This is in Matthew 7, verses 9 through 11. Which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, who's he talking to? He's talking to fathers. If his son asks him for bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? Now listen to this. He says, if you then, fathers, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Jesus knew perfectly well that a lot of dads are deadbeats. But he also knows that every single one of us, even if by contrast, can imagine what a good father must be like. And that's how Jesus wants us to think about God. He's our perfect heavenly father. And because of adoption, we enjoy communion with him. Number two, our heavenly father protects us. He provides for us and he disciplines us. And this will take us back to Matthew 6. What does a good father do for his children? I had the Chris Tomlin song running through my head this morning. Do you want me to sing it? No. Thank you, Brian. That's great. Somebody told me not to sing it. I won't. Well, you know, it's, it's a nice song. Eh? 
Good, good father, it's who you are. You're perfect in all your ways. What does a good father do for his children? He protects them and he provides for their needs. Matthew 6, 31. Therefore, do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things. And here it is, your heavenly father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. A good father cares for his children in every way imaginable. And a good father disciplines his children when they need it. Hebrews 12, 6, the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son he accepts. Again, that that family language. Now, does that mean that God is scowling at us when we disobey? It doesn't. Let's not project our twisted images of fatherhood onto God. Discipline and profound affection are not incompatible. God disciplines us because he loves us. He does it for our own good, and he doesn't do it out of spite or because we've inconvenienced him. By the way, this would be another sermon topic, but at the risk of being shocked, Can you inconvenience God? No, you can't. Can you ruin God's day? No, you can't. He's perfect. You can't add anything to him. You can't take away anything from him. And the reason why I get off on that little digression is because we need to try not to project the images of our sinfulness and our limitations onto God. He's a perfect heavenly father When he disciplines us, it's completely out of love. It's for our own good. And even when he's disciplining us, he never stops treasuring us. And he disciplines us because he longs to have sweet communion with us. When we turn back to God in repentance, we don't see a policeman with his stick ready to let us have it. What we see is what we see in the parable of the prodigal son. Luke 15, that that prodigal son, when he comes back to his father, what's his father doing? Does he stand on the deck and say, I told you so, son? No, he embarrasses himself. I mean, in the ancient Near East, you don't pick up your robes when you're an old man and run. You don't do that. And he shows his gnarly looking legs and he runs out and he's embracing his son and his son's had a speech ready for him and the dad didn't even let him give the speech and he embraces him when we turn back to God in repentance. That's the God that we see. Doesn't that make you want to repent? Another privilege that comes from adoption. We have a right to an inheritance. So it's a family privilege to be an heir. And sometimes inheritances are wonderful. Maybe there's money, there's house, there's a car that's 40 years old. But my mom inherited a Chevy Nova from my grandma. And that didn't make the trip back to Colorado. That stayed out in Wisconsin. But you know, you could receive a wonderful inheritance. And I'll tell you what, it's temporary. Earthly inheritances are temporary. Sometimes they're wasted. Even when they're managed well, eventually you're going to lose it all. It's going to go to somebody else because you're going to die. But as members of God's family, our inheritance is eternal and it cannot be lost. Um, In living memory, Ken preached on this, and I was here. That was a long time ago, brother. First Peter chapter one, when was that? Okay. (laughs) I was was actually here for that sermon, isn't that? That's that's crazy. Um, First Peter one, verse four, Peter says that an imperishable, undefiled and unfading inheritance is being kept in heaven for you. I mean, I would like to inherit a million dollars. Well, actually a million bucks doesn't get you too far in Highlands Ranch anymore, does it? (laughs) Uh, Just a a quick little story. It has nothing to do with this. But um, I had to go to Kansas, actually, when I got called out of the men's retreat last week. And I went out with my daughters, just a quick little trip, 
to take care of something. And we stopped in Goodland, Kansas, and we went to Walmart and paid half of what I thought we were going to pay for a couple salads, Arizona teas, and a bag of nuts. So let's move to Goodland. <laughs> <laughs> I think if for this example to work in Highlands Ranch, we're going to have to talk about millions, plural, or in Centennial or Parker. You know, it'd be nice to inherit millions, but Jesus is better. Maybe a little hard for us to believe, but it's true. If for nothing else, the fact that you inherit those millions and eventually you'll have to give them up. But your inheritance in heaven is better because it's forever. And you know what? Rejoicing in God's presence and sharing in Jesus' glory is better than millions of dollars. It is. And that's one of our privileges as adopted children into God's family. Another privilege. We have the testimony of the Holy Spirit. That inheritance, and I remember you probably explained it really well in the sermon on 1 Peter 1. It's true, but it seems like it's far away, right? And we sang about not by faith, but by sight. At, at some point, that inheritance, we're going to see it. And we're going to experience it, but it's still a hope. It's still off in the future. How can you be sure that you're going to have that inheritance? How can you be sure? Well, one of the ways is that God gives us his Holy Spirit. Have you ever noticed, this is in Romans 8, that Paul calls the Holy Spirit the spirit of adoption? Why? Because it's by the Holy Spirit that we are all able to call God Abba, Father. It's the Spirit that enables us to do that. And there's more. The Spirit testifies to our spirit that we are indeed children of God, and that gives us assurance. So I'm packing two or three sermons into this sermon. We could preach another sermon just on this. And if we did, I'd go to Galatians 4. You can maybe check this out at home. But Paul talks about this in Romans 8 and in Galatians 4. And in Galatians 4, Paul gives this really interesting example. He compares the experience of a child in a family to that of a slave. And again, this is hard because it's first century Mediterranean world. So let's do a little historical imagination. Back to the Mediterranean world, first century. And imagine that you're rich. Nice, nice to imagine these things. You've got a big house in the Mediterranean. So we live in the Mediterranean, and for me, this is imagination. <laughs> no big house, none of that. But imagine a wealthy Mediterranean family in the first century, and there's kids running around the house, and there's some slaves. And the kids and the slaves may actually be the same age. And maybe the, the dad is a really good man. Maybe that particular household is a great place to be a slave. But you know what? It's never the same to be a slave as it is to be a child. Why is that? Because the slave, if the slave blows it, if the slave is disobedient, if the slave doesn't do a good enough job, the father has every right to kick him out of the house. And maybe worse. But what about the child? The child should obey the father. The child needs to obey the father, but the child obeys the father not because he or she is afraid of getting kicked out of the house. The child obeys because he or she loves the father, because they want to make the father proud, because they want to enjoy their relationship with their father. Do you see what Paul is doing? It's a completely different experience. And this is, again, another privilege of adoption. We're children in God's family, not slaves. And that gives us great assurance. And it radically alters our motivation for obeying God. We'll talk about that at the end. One more privilege or blessing that's related to adoption. As adopted children, we have a family. So my main goal in this sermon is to convince you that you should see your relationship with God as that of a child with his or her perfect, loving, heavenly father. The, the vertical relationship. But that vertical relationship brings with it a whole new series of horizontal relationships. That's why the Bible talks about people in the church as brothers and sisters. That's why the Bible says, Galatians chapter 6, that the church is a family. 
because we've all been adopted into this family. I was listening to a podcast recently where a guy who's an evangelist was, was talking about doing evangelism in the 21st century, the way things are in our culture today, our cultural moment. And he said that it's, you have to have your arguments about maybe the existence of God or the truth of the scriptures or historical truth of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. But he said it's just as important to tell people why they should want to be Christians. Talking to a non-believer. It's just as important to tell that person why they should want to be a Christian. And the reason why is because the gospel answers the deepest desires of our hearts. The gospel satisfies those desires in a way that the, the world never could. And what is something that, that people long for today? Well, they long for community. They long for being a part of a group where they can be helped and where they can help and where they can lock arms with other people in sort of a common mission. Well, guess what? The church is all of that. The church is all of that, and it's better than any club that you could be a part of because what you have in common with the rest of the people there, it's not just maybe a political tendency or opinion or an interest in a sports team or whatever it may be. You are all together adopted children of God. It's a wonderful privilege, this, these horizontal relationships, a better community than the church cannot be found. And that's another blessing of adoption. So I'm talking about all these great things that go along with being adopted. Well, being adopted doesn't just imply privileges. It also implies a series of responsibilities. So being part of a family means that there are certain things that you have to do, certain ways you have to act. As a Christian, I should be proud of my heavenly father and I should work to represent him well in the world. I should live in a way that honors him. I should want other people to see how great he is. I should imitate him. Where's, where's Robin? The Beatitudes, Matthew 5, Matthew 5, 48. Be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. There's a call to imitate God as part of his family. This is what it means to be a child of God. So I become a child of God and I don't change biologically. I don't like get superpowers, you know. I don't, ontologically, I'm the same as I was before, but there's going to be a change in my actions and in my character. Being a child of God is a question of likeness. So we, we bear the family likeness, not physically, but in the things that we do, the things that we say, and our attitudes. But how does all that fit with what I said earlier? I said that God's not waiting for us to get our act together in order to adopt us. He adopts rebels. He does adopt rebels, but he doesn't leave those rebels the same. He changes them. That same spirit of adoption who enables us to cry out, Abba, Father, also, G.I. Packer says this, the Spirit puts in us the instinct to obey our Father. Isn't that interesting? The Holy Spirit changes the orientation of our hearts so that we will value the same things that our Father values. The Holy Spirit enables us to bear the family resemblance. And I'm going to come to a conclusion here. Trying to hit the reset button this morning. I was trying to hit it before coming as I was meditating on this sermon. We need an attitude adjustment. We need it constantly. We need God to help us to think better about who he is and what our relationship with him is like. If we can assimilate this, this truth of adoption better into our way of thinking, we will live happier and holier lives. I'm going to give you an example, and this hopefully will kind of summarize everything that we've talked about. How do you think God sees your efforts to obey him? You come before God with your good works. You did something good today. How do you think he sees that? Well, if you're a believer, you know that you did something good, but you also know that there's still this sin 
that clings to even your best works, stains your works, mars them. The best things that we do, we still do them with impure motives. There's still some selfishness in there. There's still some pride. How does God see those good works? What does he do? Well, we could imagine him being like the dad whose son studies really hard for the science test. And he gets a 95 and he's so proud and he comes home with that test with the 95 written on the top of it and he shows it to his dad. Look, dad, I got a 95 on my science test. And the dad bats it back at him and says, what about the other 5%? Ooh, <laughs> Is God, do you think God's like that? I, that? That kind of dad will crush his son. And pretty soon the son's not going to study hard for that test. <laughs> he's going to go do something else. Thanks be to God, that's not what God is like. We change the analogy, change the, the illustration. Um, God, he justifies us as people, but he also justifies our works. That was the third chance to shock me. I'm still here. Can I keep going? Okay. I didn't come up with this language either. God justifies our works. What does that mean? That means you come to God having done something good and you bring that good work to God. You present it to him. There's sin that stains it. God forgives that because of Jesus. You didn't do the work exactly in the right way. God covers that work with Christ's righteousness. And so when you come to God with your good works, he accepts them and he rejoices. So it's like a different dad. Different dad who's got a four or five-year-old kid and the kid's just starting to learn to write and he's just chicken scratch all over the paper. I mean, it's like illegible. And what does that loving father do? The kid comes, daddy, daddy, look at what I wrote. What does the dad do? The dad takes it and pins it up on the refrigerator. Or even better, the dad takes it to work and he plasters his wall with all these dirty papers and he's so proud of it and he doesn't care what his colleagues think. Why? Because he loves his child, he forgives the imperfections of the works and he receives them and he rejoices over them. That's how our loving Heavenly Father receives our works. And you know, that little boy or girl, when they see their chicken scratch pinned up to the refrigerator, they know that daddy took it to work and put it on the wall. They're more motivated than ever to keep on trying and do better. Their father knows that they need to do better and he'll help them. But in the meantime, he's patient and he rejoices over their obedience. So the reset button this week, let's meditate on our adoption. And may the Spirit assure us again of our favor with our loving Heavenly Father. May He increase in us that instinct to obey so that we can bear better the family likeness. And may we live in more joy, delighting in our relationship with God. A good Father who cares for us, guides us, protects us, and smiles at us. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for Jesus, for his death on the cross in our place, for his life of perfect obedience, for his resurrection, for our justification. We're grateful that you declare us righteous and that as a result, you adopt us into your family. We're grateful for the privilege of being your children. Pray that you would help us to appreciate all the wonderful benefits that come from being beloved children, having you as our loving, perfect, heavenly father. And we also want to pray that that Holy Spirit that you've given us as the first part of our inheritance would work powerfully in us to change us and transform us more and more into the image of our older brother, Jesus Christ. We ask this in his name. Amen.